they were working on, um, basically asking if I could evaluate it. Of course, you know, I, I took a look at it and sent them back you know, a nice email saying, my god, why are you using RFID in this in the first place? But that aside, <laughs> they, you know, I, I was speaking with them after that, and they said, you know, we really, really want help with designing the system. But we've gone to RSA security and asked them if they could help us, and they said that they were too busy. Which is logical, because they're just a company of about like 10 people. <laughs> Plus they've got their hands full with Secure ID and with, with the, all the other wonderful things that RSA security does. They've really only got one full-time person, more or less, on, on RFID security. I mean, and they went to us saying, you know, please, can you help us? I was like, you know, I'm a PhD student and I have a dissertation to write, so, you know, I can't help you with this. I don't have time to help you with this either. So a lot of them really have good intentions and they want help, but right now there is no place for them to get it. The reason why, there's lots of security people. There's tons of computer security people. That's why we have conferences like this. <laughs> However, how many security people now know how to properly audit and penetration test RFID? Raise your hand if you know how to do that. <laughs> Lucas raises his hand. <laughs> but the point is that right now the tools are really not out there. So we figured that we were going to work on building some tools so people can actually get a head start with learning to bring their computer security expertise into the domain of RFID just so we can start getting these companies to stop making these damn stupid mistakes. So the first thing we took a look at is fuzzing. Of course, uh, we've had lots of uh, talks on fuzzing uh, you know, today and, and yesterday. So we figured, how can we do this for RFID? So we figured we can actually do this on three layers. So at the, at the bottom, you have the framing layer uh, for RFID. At the second layer, you have the command layer. And at the top, you have the application layer. So with the framing layer, uh, I was describing before, you have starts of frames, bits, CRC, CRCs, and ends of frame. Well, there's lots of ways that you can manipulate this. For example, bits uh, for the ISO 15693 standard are constructed out of half bits. Uh, what you can do, for example, is give it invalid combinations of half bits. Other things that you can do, and, and actually how it constructs the half bits, is it uses something called Manchester encoding, which essentially what it is, is it, okay, I'll, for, for the non es amongst us, I'm going to describe this really gently. You essentially have five volts and zero volts, and Manchester encoding essentially looks at the timing between the, tra the high and low transitions. So it's actually all about the timing. So what happens if you just give it complete, total, random crap timing? <laughs> well, the answer is, and we tried this on a Philips reader of ours, is that eventually the RFID reader starts flashing. It gets slower and slower and slower. <laughs> and you look at the memory consumption, and it's not very happy. <laughs> And I do have to say that one time with the RFID Guardian version 2, by actually, actually back when the RFID Guardian was misbehaving, we actually did get this particular application to crash. <laughs> Details about this will be in some later talk. <laughs> But, uh, but the point is that uh, this stuff, we, we have seen this work. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's fuzzing like for anything else. It's just like fuzzing with wireless Wi-Fi device drivers, but now it's just, you know, the next, the, you know, the, ne the next generation. Now it's, you know, the next horizon. Now it's for RFID. Nothing new, but just new domain. Command layer. So with the ISO, uh, ISO standards, you have a lot of different commands. Uh, for example, you have, uh, what you tend to have is, uh, it, like you could have inventory commands, or you could have uh, read or write block commands, or other commands that ask what kind of a tag are you. The point is, what you're going to have is uh, commands, you're going to have flags, you're going to have parameters, oftentimes you're going to have data, and then you're going to have another checksum. So there's lots of things you can screw around with. What happens if you give it an inventory query without having the inventory flag set? Depends on how it's implemented. What happens if you uh, tell it that the amount of data that you're giving it is only, you know, so many bits and you, oops, you know, you accidentally give it more? <laughs> Implementation dependent. What happens if you give it a non-inventory query and you do have the inventory flag set? How, how, do, how does it handle all of these things? And basically, we've been working on uh, a script <laughs> that goes through the random combinations of these things so we can actually uh, test it out. And right now, our, our poor little you know, Philips RFID reader is uh, undergoing this kind of testing at the moment. So application layer. 
So on top of RFID, you're probably going to have some kind of an application, whether it's a supply chain application or whether it's something you're using to purchase your gasoline. Well, the point is that oftentimes there's a database involved. I mean, I, I told you that, uh, you know, SAP and Oracle and, and uh, IBM WebSphere and all of these, well, they're all coming up with RFID middleware. Well, I, I demonstrated, you know, before in a, in a little test environment that you could do SQL injection attacks via RFID. Well, you know, how do you automate this? <laughs> you know, I mean, there are tons of tools out there for fuzzing the application layer of things like databases. Wouldn't it be cool if you could do it over the RFID interface? Well, we thought it would be really cool. So here's what we got set up. And here, here's a little, a little sneak peek of what we've been doing with the app layer fuzzing. So we partnered with a company uh, called Beyond Security. Uh, they're Israeli. Um, uh, actually, the guy uh, who got me hooked up with this in the first place is a guy named uh, Gadi Evren, uh, who also is a frequent, talk on, uh, a frequent speaker on these kinds of topics. And they have been so kind as to uh, essentially lend us uh, free usage of their uh, generic fuzzing platform in exchange for us sacrificing a few uh, grad students to uh, actually do the real you know, elbow grease kind of work. So uh, what we've got is this is B-Storm uh, that you can see, which is their generic fuzzing platform. Uh, as to be expected, it uh, generates random crap. I mean, that's what we expect it to do. And what we do is the RFID Guardian, so this is the input that you would give to B-Storm. And essentially, we actually had to write sort of an XML kind of template to represent what uh, you know, the tag uh, information would look like. And what you're going to see then is you're going to have some tag data that you're going to have here. You're going to have a tag ID. All of this stuff is sort of going to be represented with XML. And uh, we have hooks then that we can use to essentially take the output of BStorm and to uh, basically hook it into our tag spoofer. Because once again, we can emulate RFID tags. So we, I mean, we can give it any tag ID we like. We can give it any data that we like. We can give it anything. So what happens then? Uh, the data goes over, you know, the RFID interface, uh, over the, you know, in through the RFID driver, and uh, sure enough, if you take a look at uh, the backend database logs, you start seeing all kinds of really weird entries in the database logs. <laughs> you know, where did this come from? It came via the RFID driver, <laughs> uh, which then, uh, you know, comes over the air interface from the RFID guardian. So it's just one more way into the system. Uh, but for the rest, usual old tricks, absolutely nothing new. It's just, uh, just a new way into the system. Um, and of course, when something is found, then B-Storm says, you know, potential vulnerability detected. And then you can go pursue it a little bit further with uh, a built-in kernel mode debugger that, uh, that the thing has. Or you can use your own. Or you could probably write, you know, your own Perl or Python script or whatnot if you don't feel like using B-Storm. <laughs> or just basically just trying to do a proof of uh, general concept on these things. But uh, yeah, so this is our, what we're doing with fuzzing. Another thing that is a little bit less developed, but we're also working on, is differential power analysis for RFID. So I did mention that it's, you know, the RFID Guardian is a software-defined radio. So I mean, one of the things that it can do is receive RFID signals and then send it to a very powerful processor. <laughs> what is that good for? It's also good for things like uh, differential power analysis. So we're act what we've actually done is we've built, built a, new, uh, a new probe, uh, specially tuned for 13.56 megahertz, and we're working together with a company called Riskure that's in Delft in the Netherlands. They actually built a DPA platform called Inspector that we're also using to uh, essentially test out some things with DPA. Uh, this is all really preliminary stuff, and I'm also uh, running out of time for this presentation, so I'm not going to talk about this stuff in length, but I just want to say it's something in the pipeline, so, and uh, I'm expecting good things with it. We're actually busy attacking right now a dual interface card uh, that uses triple S, and we know for a fact that it's a, it's a weak card because it's already been attacked via the uh, contact-based interface. And part of the fundamental questions that we actually want to answer is how much more difficult is it to attack it via the wireless interface as opposed to attacking it via the contact-based interface. But once again, it's old tricks. It's just old tricks in a new, new domain. So our project is real. <laughs> our project has been implemented. Our project is still being implemented. And we want people to download and play with what we have created. Our project is open source. 
The software is all available via the GPL. The hardware is available uh, via the uh, uh, MIT license for the schematics and then Creative Commons for all of the board artwork. So if you know how to make your own uh, hardware, everything you need for the Guardian. Also the v uh, Verilog uh, is also online for the uh, FPGA. If you know how to make your own hardware, everything is online already so you can actually make this and play with it already. A lot of people have been asking us, yeah, but we don't know how to make our own hardware. You know, can we, can't we just buy one? We're actually talking right now with uh, a funding organization in the Netherlands who will we'll, we'll, we'll remain nameless for the time being, but uh, we are this close <laughs> to getting seed funding for three years <laughs> to actually start uh, actually really producing these things. Also, uh, a, a very prominent businessman in the Netherlands, maybe you guys have heard of him, his name is Rob Honkheip, <laughs> he, he did something with voting machines. Um, he, he actually also uh, is going to be helping us out with the business side of things. So we have all of the ingredients there to make this real. <laughs> Essentially, uh, part of what we need is just coordinating it and getting it all together. We're working on this on my side. But another thing that we would also love is support from the community. So if you guys support this project, there's a, would like to support this project, there's a couple things you could do. One, you could go to our website and just send us an email. Uh, we're actually right now looking, trying to estimate how many of them we, we want to make. <laughs> So right now on the website it says, you know, would you like an RFID guardian? If so, please, you know, uh, send us your email address and your name and, 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 and the, uh, an approximate price you think is reasonable and uh, or the reason why you want one. So if you guys think it would be fun to play with one of these, send me a mail and I'll put you on the list. Um, but also, this is an open source project and I want to turn it into a living, breathing, contributing, <laughs> you know, kind of project. Uh, you, if any of you guys are software developers, even if you don't have the hardware, we have an emulator available for this. So you can actually still uh, perform development with this platform without having the hardware. So if you want to uh, download the software emulator and play with it and propagate any kinds of changes or improvements or new features, please feel free to do that. Uh, for the rest, if you have ideas for new features, uh, you know, complaints about things that we're doing wrong, just, just any kind of feedback at all, I, I really encourage you to send it to, send it to us uh, because we really need all the help we can get. But we really think we're creating something that's useful for people. And we hope that you agree. So for the rest, that is it. Uh, here's my contact information. So please feel free to contact me if you want any information about this. And I would be happy to take a few questions. So, thank you. All right. Yes. Um, question about the galaxy. When you start selling these things, yes. Don't you think that somebody will start like detect your device and say, "Well, I see someone walk into Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, turn on this thing, and just take a three laptop and walk out, mm -hmm. blocking all their RFID signals." Yes, I anticipate this could be a problem. But you know what? What we are building is a, essentially a pen testing device. <laughs> And it can be used for good things, and it can be used for bad things. So as a result, you're going to have the usual you know, full disclosure issues that you have with any other kind of pen testing software. So can people abuse this? Yes. But I still think that it's better that at least the good guys have these kinds of tools in their hands. So they can test their own systems. They can pen test their own systems to try to make it resilient to these kinds of, of attacks, as opposed to only having you know, the bad guys having systems like this. Because let's be honest, this wasn't that hard to build. I mean, we, we, we had like essentially a bachelor student doing most of our hardware design. So I mean, it, it really wasn't that hard to build. So I mean, yeah. So, so yes, it could have legal issues. Uh, we're also even looking for students, you know, perhaps you know, part time to do some, uh, you know, looking at, uh, at these kinds of issues so we can write another paper on it. But, uh, but yeah, it's a good question. So yes. Um, well, I mean, if it's doing something like selective jamming, I mean, I suppose if you notice that uh, a tag is always blocked, I mean, that could be a way of knowing that a guardian is there. But, I mean, you know, we're just sending out random noise, so, I mean, how do you know the difference between a guardian and normal environmental radio noise? I mean, if you're not actually, you know, really paying attention, I mean, it probably would be fairly... I want to think as soon as this device will be out, it will make countermeasures. Right, and I'm sure people will make countermeasures because, 
Of course. Yeah, look, this, this is a cat and mouse game. <laughs> and I mean, you know, as far as criticisms, you know, we've, we've gotten criticisms already for The Guardian. I mean, some guy put out a, a blog entry saying, you know, why the RFID Guardian, like seven reasons why the RFID Guardian is not enough. <laughs> 